we are doing lesson number three in the quarterly, uh, managing for the master till he comes. And what do you think of the title for this week's lesson? And the title for this week's lesson is The Tithing Contract. The Tithing Contract. It's right. I don't like it. I don't like the word contract. Like the it. legal yeah. issues yeah. popped into my mind. <laughs> yeah, yes. I'm glad you all said that because I was going to ask it. Is, is tithing a legal requirement? No. 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 Is tithing a business contract with God? No. 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 It's a relationship. Or is tithing the co a part of the covenant of grace, part of a love relationship with God? Yes. 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 Now, now, I want you to think about the way it impacts you to approach it either way. Now, we're gonna. I'm going to give you uh, two possibilities and think if they impact you the same if you approach tithing as a business relationship versus a love relationship. So you and God have entered into a legal business contract in which 10% of any profits are God's and 90% are yours versus you have entered into a love trust relationship in which everything is God's from the start, but God gives you 90% of all the gain to manage as his steward for your own necessities, recreation, charitable giving, and whatever else you decide is best to use as his steward. And he only retains 10% specifically designated for the advancement of his kingdom on earth. Does it impact you the same to approach it as a business deal or as a relationship? Or, or do you have a different reaction to it? Relationship. It's not an obligation. But if I didn't pay tithe, I'd feel guilty. <laughs> I mean, come on, let's be honest. You know. If we approach it as a, let's, we're going to keep pressing on this. If we approach it as a business contract, think uh, as long as we give our 10% or return the 10% that's owed to God, then God, in part of the legal contract, is required to use his divine power to bless us with more wealth. Because it's a contract. It's a deal. I do my part of the deal. He does his part of the deal. If we approach it that way, what motive might develop in the heart? Selfish. If our tithing is part of a love-trust relationship, but we recognize everything is already God's to start with, and he's given us 90% of it to use as his steward at our discretion, and he has re retained 10% for the specific use in the advancement of his kingdom, if we approach it that way, what, what develops in our heart? Love. Thankfulness. Gratitude. Yeah. Appreciation. Yeah. Yeah. Which way do you think God would have us approach tithing? The contract or the relationship? Relationship. relationship. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at Sunday's lesson and read the second paragraph. Second paragraph in the lesson says, the first mention of tithe in the Bible is Genesis 14, which tells the story of Melchizedek uh, meeting with Abram. The last mention of tithe in the Bible recalls the same encounter, but the words tenth and tithe are used interchangeably, Hebrews 7, 1 through 9. Note in the Hebrews... In the Hebrew story, that neither Melchizedek nor Christ were of the tribe of Levi, so tithing precedes and follows the specialness of the Levites. Nothing, tithing is not exclusively a Jewish custom and did not originate with the Hebrews at Sinai. What's the takeaway lessons that you take from this paragraph? Okay, so it says it's true. I, I think I think this is a good connection of, of the same story, both Old and New Testament, to help people understand that a tithe does mean, in fact, a tenth, because it actually specifies that in here. So it's a good way to for a biblical definition that a tithe is a tenth. So that's a good, good lesson to take away. We don't have to question what that means now. Um, what is the significance, though, for us of the fact that tithe was paid to someone before and not of the tribe of Levi? And the lesson also is making the case that tithe is not restricted to the Old Testament Jewish customs. So that's one lesson. Paid to Melchizedek before Levi, it's not restricted to the ceremonial system. That's one of the lessons, right? Mm -hmm. What about this lesson? Is it also possible, since they're making the case that the tithe was not restricted to Levi, that the story gives a bi biblical basis that the tithe is not restricted to one single group, denomination, or family, 
but is to support the advancement of the gospel and be placed wherever the Holy Spirit leads a person to return it, just as he led Abraham to give it to Melchizedek. Absolutely. Yeah. Good point. Well, keep that idea in mind as we go through the rest of the lesson. In the bottom green section of the adult quarterly, it says the following. Why is it important to understand that tithing, like the Sabbath, was not something that originated in the ancient Israel legal or even religious system? What message should we, who live after the cross, take from this truth? Well, as I heard that question, I thought, Okay, what are the differences between the things we find in the Bible that are not specifically part of the Jewish system and things that are that are part of that system? What are the differences? <clears throat> Can you think of any other examples of teachings and practices that we find coming from God in Scripture that were not exclusively a part of ancient Israel's system but which they did, but everyone else does as well, or at least supposed to, versus those that are simply part of the religious system of ancient Israel. Can you think of any other examples besides the Sabbath, besides tithing? They did those two, but those things predated them. Any others? Taxes. How about marriage between one man and one woman? Is that a practice that predates the Jewish people comes from God and is healthy for us to practice today. Yeah, good point. Okay, so let's look at some of these. How many of these? And then we'll see if we can notice some differences. So, so there's tithing, there's Sabbath, there's marriage. How about various duties and responsibilities to family and community? Does that predate that people have responsibilities and duties to fill as parents, as spouses? That, we're, that is healthy for us to shoulder and fulfill. Does that predate Israel? And then you find many of those specified in, this, in the rules and regulations to Israel. They, they spell out a lot of those, but, but they're not exclusive just to the Israel people, the, the Hebrew people, are they? What about work, useful labor? Was that given to Adam and Eve in Eden? Is it healthy for us to engage in useful labor? Not necessarily for a paycheck, but to use our energies for productivity to help our, our families, to help God's cause, to help our community. Is that good for us? Is it healthy? Yes. yes. How about dominion over the earth and godly development of the earth? Was that something, a practice that God instructed Adam and Eve to do and that we in, as image bearers of God are to continue to do on the earth today? How about ownership of various types of property and managing those properties that are placed in our hands as stewards of God? Do we find that predates the Levites and the, and the Jewish people? Do you remember Abraham was buying land in order to bury his wife and so forth, remember? Property was being exchanged. Uh, how about the principles of a healthy diet? Do we find clean and unclean meats predate Abraham? Yes. Yes, at the time of Noah, seven of the, un, uh, of the clean animals went into the ark and only two of the unclean animals went into the ark. And so there was a differentiation made prior to, and those principles are not made based on ceremonial law, they're based on the laws of health. All the animals that God permitted them to eat are all herbivores, first order in the food chain, less likely to have pollutants and other toxins in them. So if you're gonna eat an animal and prepare it the way it's, it's described and instructed in the Bible, it is gonna be least damaging to you than you eat anything out there at all. These are the laws of health stuff. And those laws of health, are they still in uh, practice or still applying to our lives today? Absolutely. What about animal sacrifices? Did they originate with the tribe of Levi, or did animal sacrifices originate prior to the time of Levi? Why don't we practice animal sacrifices today if we do all these other things that originated before? What's the difference? Jesus Christ is Christ's sacrifice on the cross took care of all that. 
Pardon? Christ's sacrifice on the cross took care of that. Okay. So, so you're right, Christ's sacrifice to the cross, but the, I guess the, the point I'm making is it's not about just simply when a practice started, but its purpose and function. All of the things we carry forward, marriage, Sabbath, tithing, healthy diet, good stewardship, uh, godly management of resources, uh, all of these are based on and living out design law practices that have direct functional impact upon our health, welfare, and development, all of them. The sacrificial system of animals never had any direct functional impact, but served as a teaching tool and an object lesson to teach the, the problem of sin and the coming Savior to save us from it. It was a teaching tool. When humankind fell into sin, God provided an object lesson to teach them the reality of what sin does and also point them to Jesus as the solution. But that object lesson became perverted with legalism and people came to believe that uh, multiple lies about it, that animal sacrifice somehow had saving benefit in the animal itself, that God was pleased with death, that God required offerings be given to him instead of realizing that the offering was being given by God to solve the sin problem for us. So Satan had so corrupted that teaching tool, that lesson, that it became necessary to put it aside and that happened at the time of Christ when he fulfilled the reality to which the tool, the teaching lesson, was pointing. That's why we don't carry it forward. What about, though, the feast days, the annual feasts? Now, they were given to Israel specifically as part of the theatrical system. Why don't we carry those? I know some Christians, I don't know if you've been approached by some, that are advocating and arguing that we still need to practice those feast days today. Have you heard that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Why, why don't we do that? Just as the, the, we don't practice the animal sacrifices because those teaching tools were swept away, but we do practice the animal sacrifice in the application of the reality to which the symbol pointed. The symbol pointed to both Christ's sacrifice for us and the application of what Christ has done into our hearts and minds. And so by experiencing that reality, we participate in what the lesson was designed to teach. Does that make sense? And we present ourselves in Romans 12 as living sacrifices, holy and, and pleasing and acceptable to the Lord. So in that way, we bring sacrifices by sacrificing ourselves and allowing the sacrifice of Christ to be reproduced in us. So we live the reality of what the symbols pointed out. Rather than avoiding the actual healing by part participating in a ceremony. Same thing with the Passover, same thing with the feasts. The feasts were just teaching tools. They had no saving benefit, and we participate in them through the reality to which they pointed. Passover blood applied to the doorpost and eating of the flesh of the sacrificial animal symbolized that we take in the, remember Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh, you have no part with me. The, Jesus is the Word made flesh. We partake of the Word of God, which is the truth that Jesus revealed into our bodies and are one to trust and open our hearts and the blood or the life and the love of Christ is reproduced in us, the doorpost of our hearts. So we experience the reality to which the old symbols, and when we do that, he passes over instead of brings a punishment upon, okay, through grace, the unleavened bread. Jesus is the bread of heaven. We partake of, again, the word made flesh, which is also symbolically in the unleavened bread, not the communion wafer, but the reality of Jesus. We partake of the word. We celebrate the wave sheaf and the recognition that Christ is the first fruits raised from the dead, and we have hope in our resurrection, the resurrection of our loved ones, because Christ now reigns in heaven. We celebrate the Pentecost as we receive the Holy Spirit who applies into our hearts and minds what Christ has already achieved, and we are 
transformed by the Holy Spirit and are gifted with gifts by the Holy Spirit. We recognize the trumpets as the call to prepare for the second coming that began with the Great Awakening in the late 19th century. And we are living in the time of that one minute or atonement where, the, where Christ is cleansing his bride and preparing his church for his return so we can see him face to face. And we will tabernacle together with him at the in a new in an earth made new once he takes us uh, to heaven and makes all things new so we celebrate these things in their reality not in their symbolism or theatrics does that make sense monday's lesson we're going to read from the middle question to the end of the lesson from the middle question to the end of the lesson it says read deuteronomy 12 and I'm going to say, before we get into this, this is where I really started to not like the lesson for this week. And I really started not wanting to have to teach the lesson for this week. And I don't do that often, but I, 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 I'm going to teach it. I'm going to bring out what I believe is the, uh, is the salient truths for our time today. Uh, and the reason I wasn't thrilled about it is because I know I'm going to get a lot of emails after we have this lesson today. People are not going to be super happy with what, what we discover, I think, today. But let's, let's read from the lesson. Deuteronomy 12, 5 to 14. These verses, and, this is, and we're reading right, right from the lesson. Read Deuteronomy 12, 5 to 14. These verses do not indicate that God's children could use their own discretion as to where their tithe was deposited. What principles can we take from these verses for ourselves today? As members of God's family, we want to understand the practice and practice his will regarding what to do with our tithe. In the Bible narrative, we learn that three times in, in each year, Passover, Pentecost, and Feast of Tabernacles, God's people were to travel to Jerusalem to bring their tithes and offerings personally and to praise and worship God. Then the Levites distributed the tithes to their brethren all over the land of Israel. In harmony with the biblical central storehouse principle, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has designated the local conferences, missions, and unions of churches as storehouses on behalf of the world church and from which the ministry is paid. For the convenience of church members, the tithe is brought to the local church, where as part of their worship experience, members bring their tithes and offerings, uh, though some use online giving. The local treasurers then forward the tithe to the conference storehouse. This system of tithe management outlined and ordained by God, boy, that's a really strong endorsement right there, outlined and ordained by God, has enabled the Seventh-day Adventist Church to have a worldwide and growing impact on the world. Imagine if everyone decided to give their tithe to whomever they wanted to and at the expense of the Adventist Church itself. What would happen to our church? Why is, the pract why is that practice then such a bad idea and contrary to scripture. Wow. So what would you say the message of this section is? How would you sum it up? Give me to your church. Give me money. It goes to the church only, to the conference. Did you hear the following? Ancient Israel was not allowed to use their own discretion as to where to place their tithe. And church members today are not allowed to prayerfully consider and use their discretion as to where to place their tithe. Did you hear that? Yes. yes. And if you prayerfully, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, placed your tithe with any other person or group than the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you are acting contrary to Scripture. Did you hear that message? Yes. yes. Very loud. Well, I just don't know how the people prior to 1863, when the Adventist church was organized, ever could pay a biblical tithe. I mean, if only the Adventist church is a right receptacle for the tithe, then the whole world prior to the Adventist church was just not being scriptural. <laughs> so let's, let's uh, look at this. It's always good to go back to the Bible they referenced, did you notice they referenced Deuteronomy 12, 5 to 14, but they didn't actually cite it. They referenced it. Well, let's go back to the Bible and read for ourselves, but we're going to actually start in verse chapter 12, verse 1, for four verses before the lesson does. And here's what Deuteronomy tells us. These are the decrees and laws you must be careful to follow in the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess as long as you live in the land. 
destroy completely all the places on the high mountains and on the hills and under every spreading tree where the nations you are dispossessing worship their gods. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, burn their ashrath poles in the fire, cut down the idols of the, their gods and wipe out their name from those places. You must not worship the Lord your God in their way. That is the first four verses. The lesson wants us to jump in on verse five. Do you think the first four verses here is laying a context that's important for us to understand? Yes. And the context of the first four verses is God is wanting and laying down specific instructions to ensure that the people of Israel, the Hebrews, do not go down the trail of pagan worship systems and cult worship systems, that they come to worship God in truth and in love for who he actually is. This is critical to understanding the rest of the instructions. We'll continue on. But you are to seek the place the Lord your God will choose from among all your tribes to put his, to put his name uh, there for his dwelling. To that place you must go. There bring your burnt offerings and sacrifices, your tithes and special gifts, what you have vowed to give and your free will offering and the firstborn of your herds and flocks. Did you notice that, did, did, as you read this, do you recognize this as a specific instruction focusing on tithing? Or is this focusing on the larger principles of worship in which tithe is included? Right. It's not going to get big. Keep going with the quote from the scripture. There, there, in the presence of the Lord your God, you and your family shall eat and shall rejoice in everything you have put your hand to, because the Lord your God has blessed you. You are not to do, excuse me, you are not to do as we do here today, everyone as he sees fit, since you have not yet reached the resting place and the inheritance the Lord your God has given you. What does this mean? What, why is God saying this? What's he trying to, to do? Why are they not to do as they see fit? What's the context? Who are these people? Where did they just come from? What's happening all around them? What was the first four verses of the context telling us? Don't worship as the heathen do. And these are a group of former slaves raised in Egypt in 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 indoctrinated, inculcated with a pagan culture and all types of mystical and superstitious beliefs about gods and the pagan systems all around them. And God is actually making the case, taking these people and making a distinction that worshiping him is different than worshiping him. He's forging them into a cohesive force to be able to resist the pagan intrusions from the world around them for the purpose of creating a people through whom the Messiah will come. Get your mind around the context here. Let's keep on with the, with the quote. But you will cross the Jordan and settle on the land the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance, and he will give you rest from all your enemies around you so that you will live in safety. Then to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling place for his name, there you are to bring everything I command you, your burnt offerings and sacrifices, your tithes and special gifts, and all the choice possessions you have vowed to the Lord. And there rejoice before the Lord your God, you, your sons and daughters, your manservants and maidservants, and the Levites from your towns who have no allotment or inheritance of, of their own. Be careful not to sacrifice your burnt offerings anywhere you please, notice, Here's where you get more definition. Anywhere you please, don't go sacrificing anywhere. Offer them at the place the Lord your, will choose in one of your tribes and there observe everything I command you. Where did he not want them to go? He didn't want them to go to the asterisk poles, to the, to the fertility cults, the mountains around them, the high places of worship where they worshiped all the pagan gods. He did not want them to go. Don't go there. You'll be corrupted by going there. This instruction that they have cited as the fact that you shouldn't think about where to put your tithe is about you shouldn't actually go and worship false systems and false gods. But what's even more interesting, in this same set of guidelines, 
in Deuteronomy, given by God, that the lesson references, we find a specific set of tithing instructions explicitly about the tithe. Two chapters later, it's one set of instructions, chapters and verse divisions were added later, God gives these instructions in chapter 14, just two chapters later, specifically about the tithe. The lesson left that out. Why would the lesson leave that out? Didn't Interesting. Well, let's read those specific set of tithing instructions that are part of these same instructions that the le lesson has referenced for us and see if we can understand what God would have us do with our tithe and, and why would the lesson leave it out? And you can find this in uh, chapter 14, starting in verse 22. Here's, the, here's what it says in Scripture. Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. Pause right there. You know, Christy and I had uh, a few tomato plants this year, and they produced a lot of tomatoes. It didn't even cross our minds to bring 10% of them to church and put them in the offering plate. It didn't. I mean, it just never crossed our minds to do it. Huh. Should we have? Do you think the institutional church would have been happy with a bag of tomatoes put in the plate? Well, it seems like the instructions in Deuteronomy that were to do this. Uh, if we didn't do it, are we not living according to Scripture? Or has culture changed? as well as what we recognize as our increase or income or wealth than that of the ancient Hebrew people. Let's keep going. But notice, be sure to set aside the tithe of all you have your fields from the produce each year, and notice what you're to do with it. Eat the tithe of your grain, new wine and oil, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord, your God, at the place he will choose as a dwelling place for his name so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. Wait. So what are we to do with the tithe? Eat. <laughs> so uh, the fact that we ate the tomatoes, I guess we are actually good with the Bible then, aren't we? But, but notice, I thought the tithe was to be consumed by the church. But the Bible says the tithe is to be consumed by the tither. Am I misreading it? Do you have a version that tells them to do something different with it? We'll get down to the rest of the verse in a moment, but at this section, at this section, does it tell them to consume the tithe? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why would that be? What is the purpose of the tithe? What's its purpose? <laughs> Historically, our understanding, the prime purpose of the tithe is to advance what? The gospel. The gospel. The, the gospel, that's right. And the gospel is the good news. The good news about what? Jesus. God's character. God's word. The good news about? God. God's character. About God, that's right. About God. So what is God's purpose in having ancient Hebrews spend his tithe on items that they were to consume while worshiping him. God is contrasting Yahweh from all the pagan gods. What, had, what, what he's told them to do is take his tithe, use it to bless themselves. This is what's happening, to ingest it, to eat it, to celebrate, which is the exact opposite of all the pagan and Egyptian gods and cults around them. All the false systems have gods that make up rules, inflict punishments upon the sinners for rule breaking. As such, the sinner, the worshiper, is required to bring gifts and offerings to the offended God, to appease the wrath of the God, to pay for their sins, to influence the God to, for forgiveness, or to get blessings. And the more costly the gift you pay your God with, the more likely you are to get a good response. And this ultimately led to the ultimate sacrifices. The ultimate thing I can give to the God to influence him is the, my firstborn child. And this led to human and infant sacrifices in these pagan cults. This is how it worked. And this is why God tells them, 
by action, by demonstration, that it is not he that needs to be gifted from them to influence him, but he is the source of all blessings, and all blessings come from him to them, and he sacrifices himself for the good and welfare of his people. So the tithe, his resources, were being used to bless them, to functionally have them experience God is good. God is the one who gives for us. His name is to be revered. They learn to revere and be in awe and admire the name of the Lord when his tithe is used to bless them. The gospel is advanced. Do you see it? Now that you put it that way. <laughs> but let me keep on. Keep on with our Bible verse now. But if that place... So if you take your grain, if it's close, and you consume it before the Lord. But if the place is too distant and you have been blessed by the Lord your God and cannot carry your tithe, because the place where the Lord will choose to put his name is so far away, then exchange your tithe for silver and take the silver with you and go to the place the Lord your God will choose. Use the silver to buy whatever you like, cattle, sheep, wine, or other fermented drink, or anything you wish, then you and your household shall eat there in the presence of the Lord, your God, and rejoice. Again, what is God instructing them to do with the tithe? <laughs> Who is to use the tithe? Who is to consume the tithe? The, people. the tithers, not the church. Why aren't they applying this lesson to us today? I want to know why they're drinking fermented wine. That's the next thing we're going to get to in just a moment. Uh, not only does it instruct them to use the tithe to buy fermented drink and other staples, but the worshipers are to consume it, not merely give the silver to the church. Do you see some inconsistencies here in picking and plucking certain Bible text up? to promote a certain view and a certain teaching while ignoring other Bible texts that would seem to teach something different. This is not how we're to approach scripture. We're supposed to take it all and harmonize it into principles and practices that are consistent with our creator God and his design laws for reality. And I think I explained how, why God used the tithe the way he did here and how it directly advances the good news about him by contrasting he is the giver and the source of all blessings in direct opposition to all the pagan gods which required gifts given to them. We'll come to the fermented one in just a moment. Let's finish the text. We'll come back to it. Now notice the next, as we finish up this, this, this section of scripture. And do not neglect the Levites living in your town. For they have no allotment or inheritance of their own. At the end of every three years, bring all the tithes of that year's produce and store them in your towns so that the Levites, who have no allotment or inheritance of their own, who, who, yeah, and, and the aliens and the fatherless and the widows who, who live in your town may come and eat and be satisfied. And so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the works of your hand. So if we use these instructions in Deuteronomy for tithing to the organized system, it would suggest that we would use two-thirds of the tithe to celebrate each year for, with ourselves, and one-third would be given to the system. Am, am I misreading the scripture here? Hmm. I don't think it's a mystery as why this text was left out. <laughs> so how do we understand the issue of buying whatever we want, including fermented wine, with our tithe to celebrate before the Lord? Is that a difficult thing for us to understand? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It shouldn't be put yourself in the time, in the setting. What happens to wine without refrigeration or vacuum sealing? <laughs> ferments. 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 Two things, only two options. It either ferments or turns to vinegar. That's what happens. So fermented wine was a common drink of the day. 
God is not endorsing drunkenness. In fact, the Bible specifically warns against drunkenness throughout. But God is meeting the people in the reality in which they live. They routinely drank weak fermented wine. That's part of their meal and part of their routine practices. And God is telling them in this context, whatever they prefer to be their drink that they have with their meals, get that drink and celebrate before the Lord and recognize that the bounty and the blessing they have is the Lord's gift to them because God is good. It's that simple. It would be an error to use this text to make a case for or against alcoholic beverages. Okay, I'm going to pause. What do you all think what we're, about this, about what we've been talking about so far? I have an observation to make in that uh, sure. the, the churches, ever since the Catholic Church began, if you will, have tried to make a distinction between the clergy and the laity. And this very clearly brings out to me that the believers, the tithers, the laity are the ones who are, are actually participating in the promotion of the understanding and the love of God as much or more so than the clergy. Oh, I like that. I like that. And we're going to unpack that some more, I think, in just a moment. So the next question, is tithe a measure of righteousness, uh, of our righteousness or our faithfulness with God? Okay, did those who demanded Christ be crucified pay tithe, even on the herbs of their garden? Luke eleven forty two. they were very faithful tithe payers. The fact that they paid tithe, did that make them faithful to Jesus? No. 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 So the, the fact that the betrayers of Jesus paid tithe does not mean that tithe is not part of a healthy relationship with God. It is a part, but tithe paying cannot be used as a measure of our relationship with God. <clears throat> so what is the purpose of the tithe? to be used to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. The next question then is, to whom is the tithe to be returned? Whom do we give our tithe? If you lived 1,000 years ago during the dark ages, to whom would you pay your tithe? Would you be advancing the gospel to give it to the Roman church in the dark ages? Would it be an advancement of the gospel to give your tithe to the Roman church to carry out the crusades, to fund the crusades? No. <laughs> What about today? Would God have his tithe given to the institutions and organizations that are misrepresenting him as you understand it? No. Should we, do we have a responsibility to evaluate where we place and return the tithe? Yes. Or should we blindly pay to organizations of our upbringing without question, without thought? One of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church wrote the following in Daughters of God, page 106. Uh, there are ministers' wives who have been devoted, earnest, whole-souled workers, gi giving Bible readings and praying with families, helping along by personal efforts just as successfully as their husbands. These women give their whole time and are told that they receive nothing for their labors because their husbands receive wages. I tell them to go forward and all such decisions will be revised. The word says the laborer is worth it, worthy of his hire. When any such decision as this is made, I will, in the name of the Lord, protest. I will feel it is my duty to create a fund from my tithe money to pay these women who are accomplishing just in a, as an essential work as the ministers are doing. And this tithe I will reserve for work in the same line as that of the ministers, hunting for souls, fishing for souls. That, that was written by Ellen White. Here's another one. This is out of second manuscript release, page 99 uh, to page 100. It has been presented to me for years, and I wonder by whom that was presented to her, that my tithe was to be appropriated by myself to aid the white and colored ministers who were neglected and did not receive sufficient income to properly to, uh, to sufficient income properly to support them. I have myself appropriated my tithe to the most needy cases brought to my notice. I have been instructed to do this, and as the money is not withheld from the Lord's treasury, think that through. I wonder who instructed her to do that. You can, I'll leave that with you to decide, but she was instructed to do that. 
and, and, and not giving it into the organized church, but giving it directly to people who weren't being funded, she says is not withholding it from the Lord's treasury, but is returning it to the Lord's treasury. Very interesting. It is not a matter that should be commented upon, for it will necessitate my making known these matters, which I do not desire to, because it is not best. Some cases have been kept before me for years, and I have supplied their needs from the tithe, as God has instructed me to do. Okay, well, there we know. And if any person shall say to me, Sister White, you, will you appropriate my tithe where you know it, will, it is most needed? I shall say, yes, I will, and I have done so. Now you know why they shipped her to Australia, eh? <laughs> mm -hmm. So this individual believed that her tithe was to go directly to people who are not employed by the institutional church, but are promoting the true gospel message. And in doing so, she was acting at God's direction, she believed, and the money was going into God's treasury or storehouse. Is there a hand there? Yeah. A question? Yeah. Just, a, just a question. How could every three years, one-tenth of, of the 11 tribes could sustain the Levites? Would that be enough? So uh, 11 times a tenth versus one eleventh tenth. Think that through. And that's you have 11 tribes bringing a tenth. Every three years, though. Every three years versus... So, so to me, it's, it's 11 tribes supporting one. So the numbers, do the math. Yeah. I, think, I think it's clearly was sustainable. That's why God set it up. I don't think he would set it up a way that wouldn't be sustainable. But uh, we can have some mathematics person do the math on the numbers of people bringing a tenth of their income. Uh, and do you think about, you know, just, just look at the, the church organization and what our church does with the tent, with the tent, and look at some of the conference and, and stats on how much tithe comes in uh, every year and what you can do with one year's worth of tithe for a group of people that is one eleventh the size of the organization. Or one twelfth, excuse me, one twelfth the size of the organization. So I, I think it was plenty, my personal view, if they were actually paying an honest tithe. So what do you think about this, uh, this particular individual? Do you think this, you know, the, if we apply what this individual did to what we read in our lesson, in Sunday's lesson, this person is not following scripture. She's following scripture. They're, the they're, lesson isn't. <laughs> they're unscriptural according to our lesson because they're not returning without thought tithe to the institution. <clears> hmm. <throat> That's a t oh, there you, boy. Hmm. What are you going to do with that? Nothing. <laughs> My personal view is this. I always do. My personal view about this is, is this. I think that the gospel of Jesus Christ would advance much more rapidly if every single person who paid tithe serious, took seriously the responsibility of where they placed their tithe. This would require them to study and determine for themselves what the true gospel of Jesus Christ is and then examine where they are placing their tithe uh, and supporting all avenues that are advancing the true gospel. And not only would those uh, organizations be uplifted and blessed with more resources to advance the gospel, but the individuals who are paying their tithe would come to a deeper understanding of the gospel and would be more powerful advancers of the gospel in the sphere of influence in which they live and circulate. And so I think the gospel would, would go forward much more rapidly if people would take seriously the question, where do I place my tithe? Where do I return it? Is this a place that's advancing the gospel? I think everything about the whole equation of God's kingdom advancing would improve rather than the view of, I'm not allowed to think about it, I can't ask questions, it's not really important, that institution is the institution they receive it and I just write the check out. Uh, Teresa, you had a hand up? What about taking your tithe and using it for the material to send to people so they can be educated on the truth if they have no one in their area or no way to receive the truth other than material? So uh, this, my personal view is that every person is going to have to be led by the Holy Spirit on how to use the tithe for the advancement of the gospel. That's its mission. It's its purpose. The tithe is used to advance the kingdom of God on earth. And if, if Holy Spirit has impressed you like 
Ellen White was impressed to use your tithe in a specific way to advance the gospel. I suspect that she was giving it directly to these workers, but I suspect if there was a need to help uh, a, you know, purchase a Bible for one of these people she was studying with, the tithe would have been used to put a Bible in somebody's hand. Tuesday's lesson. What is the purpose of the tithe? There are two reasons. One we've already articulated, and that is to advance the gospel. But the lesson highlights another very good reason, and that reason, and it says in the, um, in the third paragraph, tithing is important because it helps us establish a relationship of trust with God to take one-tenth of your income and give it away, uh, though technically it belongs to God anyway, truly takes an act of faith, and only by exercising faith will your faith grow. This is an excellent point from the lesson, and it's true. As we exercise faith and put things into practice that we believe are true, we mature and we grow in the practice. So there is another individual purpose, and besides the, the expansion of the gospel in the, in the world, the individual is blessed through the practice, and that's another purpose of the time. Wednesday's lesson, um, Ask the question whether we should pay tithe on the gross or the net income. <laughs> First, what do you th when you hear the question, should we pay tithe on the gross or the net income? What's your reaction to the question? How do you how does that question hit you? Legal. Nitpicking. <laughs> Nitpicking. Legal. Yeah. I mean, it, it just hit me the same way. The lesson goes on to make an argument that tithes should be paid on the gross income. They make a long argument. They even make a quotation where the, where the general conference committee of some sort voted in the 90s uh, why, why and how it should be on the gross income. Wow. What do you think about that? Well, are we told it's supposed to be on the increase, though. <laughs> if, if you read their argument, you will see uh, um, it... I'm going to tell you, it comes across, the way they approach it, comes across very organizationally serving. Right. Yeah. Of course. It doesn't come across it's in any way that seems to connote the grace and love and mercy and kindness of God. But do you think Paul's instructions in Romans 14 apply to this question of gross or net income? And Paul, uh, will, remember we wrote Romans 14, 1 through 5. Does this apply to tithing or not? Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on the on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man's faith is weak and he eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not, who does not, and the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master, he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Amen. Do you think this instruction from Paul applies to the question of gross or net tithing? Or I'm just reaching out and misapplying scripture? <laughs> I think so what's the point Paul is making here in Romans 14? What's the what's the principle that can be applied? Depends on your relationship with God. It does depend on your relationship with God. There's no question. But can two people both have a love relation with God, both trust God, and one believe they need to pay the net, and one need to pay on the gross? Can two loving, trusting people come to a different conclusion on that? Yes. Yes. So what's the point Paul is making, and I want to un identify the point or the principle and then see if it applies to the tithing question. So the point Paul's making, it's not about food or about days of worship. It's about what people believe about these things. In Paul's day, meat that they would purchase at the meat market, most of it, the butchered meat, the, the chops, the cuts, the, the ribs, the ribeyes, whatever you're getting, most of the butchered meat came from animals that were sacrificed that morning in pagan cult worship. And some of the immature believers were fearful that if they ate meat from the meat market that had that morning or that evening been sacrificed 
to a pagan god that by eating the meat, they would give the pagan god power over them. Those, Paul saying, those with great faith know that the idol is, is nothing but wood and stone, and sacrificing an animal to the idol changes nothing about the nutritional quality, and so in great faith, you know that the idol can't do anything, nor the demonic forces behind the idol can harm any of the people who are protected by God's agents, and therefore they can eat whatever they want without fear. But the person who has superstitions, the person who has fear, the person who believes that if they eat that, then they put themselves under the power of the, of the uh, pagan god, then it's better for them not to eat it than to live in fear, guilt, superstition, superstitious anxiety. Then, then if your faith is, is, that, is that level, just don't eat and be at peace. That's the issue. It's not actually about the idol. It's not about the sacrifice. It's not about the meat. It's not about the diet. The, uh, the diet. It's about what a person believes is happening. And he's saying if you believe that, you're going to sear your conscience. You're going to feel guilty. You're going to have shame. You're going to worry. It's going to interfere with your, with your relation with God. Does this principle then come back and apply to tithing? If a person pays on the net, but they believe that in so doing they are cheating God, is the problem on the amount of tithe they're paying? Or is the problem on the fact that they're acting and making a choice to be a cheat? Yeah. It's not the gross of the net. It's what they believe about it. And this is the principle. Every person be fully persuaded in their own mind. God is interested in the motive of the heart. And if in your understanding you pay on your increase and your increase comes after the, uh, it, it, from the net check that you receive every week, then that's what you pay. And if you believe your increase comes in the gross, then that's what you pay. It's about an honest love, trust relationship with God, and you return to him his portion. And it's about honesty and integrity. It's not about gross or net. Every person be fully persuaded in their own mind. Why do you think the lesson, though, seems to make a very hard case, very hard case, for mindless, thoughtless paying on the gross? Clergy always knows better. <laughs> <laughs> well, which is going to result in the institution receiving more? Right. Right. Also, build, their law lens. Build bigger buildings. They can have more... <laughs> So it's interesting, they did, put this, they did put this quotation out of the testimonies, uh, volume four, page 469. They put this right into the lesson. It's interesting. It says, everyone is to be his own assessor and is left to give as he purposes in his heart. Wow. Well, that seems to support our conclusion from Romans 14, doesn't it? Yeah. Let every person be fully persuaded in their own mind. And it seems to go exactly the opposite of the idea that we are not supposed to consider prayerfully these things, that we are to give without personal consideration. It seems to be the opposite of that. Does it make a difference in our personal spiritual development if we give mindlessly to rules that an institution has indoctrinated us to follow Versus, we give from a prayerful and understanding heart. Does it make a difference yes. to our personal spiritual journey? Yes. <clears throat> now, in Thursday's lesson, and we might get through the whole lesson today, the lesson states the following. This week, we have reviewed several of the con constituent elements of the tithe. One the amount, which is a tenth or 10% of our income or increase. Two, taken to the storehouse, the place from which the gospel ministers are paid. Interesting. Three, honoring God with the first part of our income. Four, used for the right purpose, the support of the ministry. It is our responsibility as church members to uphold the first three items. It is the responsibility of the storehouse managers to make sure that the tithe funds are, are used properly. Well, it's true that 
anybody in a position of responsibility who receives tithes or offerings has a responsibility to use it wisely to the best degree that God would direct in the use of those words. No question about that. That's right. They do have that responsibility. Does that mean, though, that those who either return the tithe or donate offerings to various organizations have no responsibility to assess how the organizations are using the donated or returned monies? In other words, they're saying your responsibility is to give, our responsibility is to decide where, and you don't have any basis to question our responsibility. So don't ask us where it's being spent, how it's being spent. That's on us. You just need to give. <laughs> Sounds like Zelensky. <laughs> <laughs> Mindless. No, no decision, no prayer, no thinking, no... Uh -uh. Not so, or do we? Do we actually have a responsibility to evaluate the where, where the ties are going and what they're being used for and the offerings and, and give where the Holy Spirit is, in, is, is enlightened our minds and convicted our hearts that the funds will do best at this place, time, in human history for God's cause? I am all about people deciding for themselves. Now, do you see why I didn't want to really have to teach this class this week? It, it, it wasn't a lot of fun, honestly. It really wasn't. Can you anticipate some of the emails I'm going to get this week? <laughs> yes, and I'm going to promise you, somebody's going to ask the question, are you saying we shouldn't pay our tithe to the church? Did I say that today? No. 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 I never said that. Ever. I said you, I'm saying you shouldn't mindlessly pay anywhere. You should do it from an intelligent heart, led by the Holy Spirit, to return where you believe the, the resources will do the best for God's kingdom. And that very well may be your church. It very well may be. Does that make sense? Any questions? And does it all have to go to one place at one time? I mean, So that's a good question, too. 10%. Well, why can't 10%? 2% here, the 5% there, wherever you really feel. I got the... I got the impression from Ellen White, that's exactly how it happened. She would take her tithe and she would divvy it up and some would go to this pastor's wife and some would go to this particular pastor or minister that wasn't being compensated properly. And so she divvied it up and split it out where she could support the most um, you know, individuals in her case that were advancing the gospel. So I think you're exactly right. Yep. All right, let's go ahead and close with prayer and then we'll do our Q&A time. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for your love. We thank you for... Uh, the, the fact that you are the source of all blessings, that we do not have to bring tithes and offerings to you to pay you to be kind to us, but that all blessings, all gifts come from you and everything we bring back, we, we return to you because we love you and we wanna advance your kingdom. We get, pray that you will give us hearts that love you and others, wisdom and discernment of where you would have us take the resources you put in our hands and use them for the greatest blessing in this world to advance your kingdom. We pray in your holy name. Amen.